I'm a very hopeful person. Uh, one of my colleagues said, do you see the glasses half empty or half full? And I always, she said, I always look at it as how big is the glass? And our glass is very big right now. But we are Stanford, we are the US, and we are global partners with many smart people around the world. And one of the things this pandemic has shown me is that when we roll up our sleeves, we can get this done. Look at you all here today. Did we think we would be here? So we are gonna do this, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about where we were briefly, but where we're headed. So this is a big pandemic, but if you look all the way back to the beginning of this, these two millennia, so all the way back to the beginning of the common era, you see that we have had pandemics around the world. And you can see some of them are pretty big. The Black Death, for example, 200 million people. Um, so we are not unfamiliar. We have always had diseases. Infectious diseases have been with us forever, and they will be for time to come. If you look at death tolls, the death tolls were much bigger in early days. We didn't understand germ theory. We didn't understand how to take care of people with illnesses. We didn't have antibiotics. So I would argue that we are much better prepared now for all of the challenges that our evolving uh, global situation is going to do to put us in touch with a lot of these organisms. Now, this is why we are going to have to prepare. This is a slide taken from the CDC, just a, a snapshot of what's out there today. So in the red are newly emerging viruses and bacteria, in the uh, green are re-emerging, and then there's one deliberately emerging. And we, of course, we talk about bioterrorism, which we need to keep in mind, although the risk, fortunately, is low. So we know that there are agents out there that we need to deal with, and many of us are ready to deal with them. I worked at the Centers for Disease Control before I took my faculty position here many years ago, the Epidemic Intelligence Service. And you can see here all of the different outbreaks that we have dealt with here in the US and elsewhere. This is just a small sampling, including smallpox, polio, anthrax, influenza, etc. We know how to deal with these viruses and bacteria. So it's not an if, but a what and a when. We've had six influenza pandemics in just over a century. Ebola viruses have spilled over from animals about 25 times in the past decade, few decades. The last just happening last week in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where I worked for some time. We've had seven coronaviruses. Three of those are cold viruses. I'm sorry, four of those are cold viruses. And the other three have evolved just since 20, uh, the year 2000. So we, it's not a matter of if. We are going to have another spillover event. How do we deal with those? So what have we learned and what can we take forward? I'm going to go through these very quickly. First, the world is smaller than ever. Second, we need to track better and collaborate more. Third, we have to think smart and act fast. Fourth, harness the power of technology. Fifth, equity matters. And sixth, misinformation kills. So the world is smaller than ever. Well, I'll show you a picture. But in 2017, the International Civil Aviation Organization documented a record-breaking 4.1 billion people who traveled that year compared to just a few million in the 1950s. Now, we know that that number dropped radically in the last year and a half, but it's going to go back up. I know we're all going to be back where we want to be, flying to visit family, friends, doing business, etc. So this is going to move viruses around the world and other organisms. This is a snapshot of the pre-pandemic time, just one day's worth of flights around the world. So every disease that is transmissible is only a 24-hour ride away from, from anybody in the world. So we know this is um, a way we're going to be exposed in the future. So second, we need to think smart and move fast. We're trained to do this job. Epidemiologists and researchers, I work in global health. We've been doing this, putting out Ebola, cholera, pandemics around the world, smallpox. So we've been doing this. Why hasn't it worked? Well, part of that has been it's hard to prove a negative. When you don't see a disease, you forget that there is infrastructure in place to deal with that. We need to strengthen those infrastructure systems that we have been 
slowly letting uh, crumble over the many years of our successes. And you just heard Dan Ho talk about how well we're doing in the public health sector. We need to build that up. So track and collaborate. If there's one thing we can do well, it is track and collaborate. And we need to do this even better. We are so good here in Silicon Valley in collecting big data. We need to do this better at the federal level. We need to do this better at the global level. If we don't look, we don't see. If you don't see, you will always respond too late. So as we heard before from one of our uh, other colleagues, if you don't know what you don't know, so we need to make it our business to know as much as possible and to work with others. These two pandemics of SARS and SARS-CoV-2 started off because we did not have enough collaboration between countries to share data early enough. And here's an example of an amazing system. This is the World Health Organization Global Influenza Surveillance and Response System set up over 30 years ago to track influenza and other viruses. It's how we keep influenza in check. And believe me, even though we have pandemics, they could be much worse if we did not have this system. And we can build on this system now. So harness the power of technology. I don't need to tell this audience how well we have done with that overall. If you look at this slide, you can see that over the, the time since the pandemic started, how rapidly uh, antivirals, treatments, and vaccines were developed for this virus. We can keep doing this and we need to allow the private sector and the public sector to really build out and, uh, and pivot, repurpose and new drugs and treatments so that we can build the future um, treatments that we will need for what is to come. And we can't predict what that will be. So if we talk about the history of mRNA vaccines, they go back to the discovery of mRNA in 1960 and the first use of these vaccine platforms in, um, in 1990. So we knew about this platform. We just did not have the right opportunity to use it. So we need to invest in our basic sciences, the people who are doing the work that we're going to need for the future events that we can't yet predict. So we know we can do it. But equity matters. This is a slide showing the global scramble for coronavirus vaccines. I'm going to show you here. This was a year ago, before we even, oh, over a year ago, before we even had a vaccine in a bottle uh, to be given. And this was who had already bought the supply of pr promised vaccines. The UK, the US, the European Union, and Japan. That's great, but what about the rest of the world? This is a virus that will exist everywhere, anywhere if it exists everywhere. And so we need to vaccinate our way out of this pandemic. We need to share resources and the ability of our colleagues in lower resource countries to build their own technology to share uh, um, in, in the health uh, equity that, um, that, that many of us already have. And you can see here the percentage of the global population overall um, under eight, um, 18 years of age and older in high income versus non-high income. Non-high income in the dark bars on the left. And you can see on the right that over 50% of all the vaccines currently available are being given in high resource countries. Now, we are working to build that up. Part of it is just access to vaccines, but the other part is access to infrastructure. So we'll, we, that's a, another call to action for us. Access to hand washing is very simple. Most of the world, as you can see there, except for the dark blue bars at the bottom right, have very poor to no access to soap and water. So if we can't get soap and water, how are we gonna be able to get vaccines to people? This is another area where equity matters. And then finally, misinformation kills. One, the main factor, um, that this is not a political statement, but the ma main factor that predicts COVID deaths in this country is what political party people voted for. And that's not a result of the, your political views. It's a result of the misinformation that has been going out through algorithm-based uh, approaches around the world. We need to get the facts, the right facts to people, and we need to keep people who are profiting from this misinformation, believe me, they are, uh, from, from killing our colleagues and our friends around the world. So, what next? The G20 has just called for $75 billion in international financing for pandemic prevention. It's not enough, but it's a start. We have to remember what happened today so that we don't go back, so that we don't repeat the mistakes that we made 
There were some important ones, but we did a lot of things right too. The Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations is a global public-private partnership that was started four years ago. We need to put more effort into that, that program. The World Health Organization has its plan there on the right. It needs to be beefed up and we all need to collaborate together. The world needs to address this as a unified um, uh, collective so that we can really uh, address the inequities that this pandemic has demonstrated. And then finally, the National Security Council Directorate on Global Health Security and Biodefense is also being reinstated here in the federal government of the US. So we will be better prepared for pandemics in the future. So in summary, what have we learned? The world is smaller than ever. We have to track and collaborate, think smart, act fast, harness the power of technology, equity matters, and misinformation kills. We've learned those lessons, we can do them all, and I hope to see you again at a future reunion where we can say we've done all of these things well. Thank you so much.